Good morning everyone and a very warm welcome to our service this morning. It's great that you could join us and this is the uh, first Sunday in Lent as we begin our journey through Lent from Ash Wednesday through to uh, Monday Thursday in Holy Week, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. There's some, uh, some, some pictures just now of, uh, of some of the flowers in the back garden here at Dean Rectory. And uh, we're reminded of the seasons, as I guess, as we look at these, these pictures, particularly the pictures of um, snowdrops. Snowdrops remind us that spring is just around the corner. In just a few weeks' time now, it's spring. And we give thanks to God for the seasons and uh, for all his good gifts to us. You know, in the, in, the, in the world, the world has been like this for a long time. There is so much injustice and lots of people who need just basic things like food and clean water haven't got those things. But that's not God's fault. That's our fault because we don't take the good things that God gives us and, and share them around as we should. We're not such brilliant stewards of all that God gives us. But God continues to give and God is so generous, even in testing times, even when there's a global pandemic. God is so good, so kind, so generous. And I hope that we can count our blessings each day. Um, in uh, 2 Corinthians in the New Testament, uh, there's, a, there's quite a long passage about uh, giving and being good stewards and helping others and in the middle of this passage uh, 2 Corinthians says and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times having all that you need you will abound in every good work God provides us with so much in order to, to live for him and to do his work in this world. Uh, when I was a kid, um, my granddad on my mum's side, he had, a, had an LP of uh, country gospel. And uh, he would play this, this country gospel uh, LP. If you don't know what an LP is, then Google it. Uh, um, he would play this, uh, this album quite often. Uh, particularly on Sunday afternoons and uh, one of the songs on this album was um, had had the uh, the chorus count your blessings and the chorus went count your blessings name them one by one count your blessings see what God hath done count your blessings name them one by one and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Shall we give thanks to the Lord this morning before we do anything else, before we, we sing, before we, we hear the Bible readings, before we, we do anything else, let's, let's count our blessings. And thank the Lord for all the good things he sent our way. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the, the seasons. Thank you for the spring flowers just, just coming up. Thank you for your abundance of, of blessings to us, for life itself. Thank you, Lord, uh, for, um, for Jesus. Thank you for the hope that we can have because Jesus came to earth, died on the cross, rose again and is alive. And we can know him personally today. Help us to get to know Jesus better today in, through this week and through Lent. And Father, uh, wherever we are with you, wherever we think you might be with us, help us to know that you are very close to us right now. And may our hearts and our minds be open to the truth of your word. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Everything that, everything that I 
God's breath, praise the Lord. Everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise you in the morning, praise you in the evening, praise you when I'm young and when I'm old. Praise you when I'm laughing, praise you when I'm grieving, praise you every season of the soul. If we could see how much your work, your power, your might, your endless love, then surely we would never cease to praise. Everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise you in the heavens, joining with the angels, praising you forever and a day. Praise you on the earth now, joining with creation, Calling all the nations to your praise If we could see how much your worth Your power, your might, your endless love And surely we would never cease to praise Everything that, everything that Everything that has breath, praise the Lord Everything that Everything that, everything that has been praise the Lord. Everything that, everything that, everything that has been praise the Lord. Everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Everything that, everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Everything that, everything that,
reading today is taken from Romans chapter 3 verses 21 to 26. But now apart from the law the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello everyone. As we come to God's word, let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're continuing in our series in Romans, and today we get to a big turning point in the letter as it unfolds. A big turning point. I wonder what's your favourite turning point in a story, in a novel, or in a film? Lots of great films and novels have a turning point where everything suddenly changes and you see it in a different way. One of my favourites in this regard is a film called The Shawshank Redemption. It's often near the top of people's list of favourite films. Uh, close your ears if you don't want to know what happens. Spoiler alert. Um, in this film, there's a man called Andy who goes to prison and he's told at Shawshank Redemption, uh, sorry, the Shawshank Prison, when they sentence you to life, that's exactly what they take. He's in there for life and he doesn't have any hope of getting out. Uh, but he makes the most of his time, he has a few business ventures, he gets on side with the warden. But then towards the end of the film, the big turning point is that Andy has suddenly escaped from his prison cell. Where's he gone? They search for him, the warden searches his cell, and he picks up a rock and throws it at a poster on the wall. And the rock goes through the poster. The warden rips off the poster, there's a big hole, and all through his time in prison, Andy has been digging a tunnel from his prison cell to get out of the prison and then out of the grounds. It's an incredible escape, a massive turning point. Suddenly your whole view of what's been going on is turned around. Well, here in Romans, Paul has been showing how the whole of the human race is in a kind of a prison. All human beings, as we've seen, are guilty of suppressing the truth of God. It makes us unrighteous, as we've seen time and again, and so we all deserve to be under the wrath of God. That's been the message. And we had a time of going through these chapters, seeing that really thoroughly as Paul lays it out. Paul has been acting like a prosecution lawyer, saying no one is good enough based on how we've treated God and how we've lived our lives. No human being is righteous. But now we come to the big turning point. It's not only the biggest turning point in the book of Romans. It's not even the, only the biggest turning point in the Bible. This is the biggest turning point in the whole of the history of the world because at the cross of Jesus Christ everything turned around. God provided a way out of the prison, a way out for sinners from under his wrath. Verse 21. But now, 
apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Jesus Christ is the only one who can get us out of the prison, and as we're going to see, he did it through his death on the cross. But this escape route, Paul, is clear to say here as he opens up this section, was not a new invention in the time of Jesus. It is something to which the law and the prophets, that is the whole of the Old Testament, testifies. Okay, so we sometimes have this idea of a contradiction between the Old and the New Testament. That is simply not the case. The Old Testament tells us about God's love as well as about God's judgment against sin. Just like we've seen in the New Testament, it does tell us about God's judgment against sin and how seriously he takes it, as well as about God's love. The two work together. The Old Testament points forward to this wonderful turning point of Jesus when he died on the cross and opened up that solution, that rescue from God's judgment against the sin that we've all committed. When Jesus came to earth as a person, and died on that cross and rose again, the promise of the Old Testament became a reality. The law and the prophets testify to this massive turning point. Well, in these six verses here in Romans 3, we have one of the most rich and deep explanations of how the cross saves people from the sin that we've committed, from the judgment that we deserve. So how does this work? Well, firstly, we see God makes the unrighteous righteous. As we've said before in Romans, there's a lot of language of the law court here in the first few chapters. Now, I've never been in the dock accused in a courtroom, uh, but imagine I um, had, say, broken lockdown, okay? And um, I was out, say, I made an unnecessary journey somewhere, and there was a police officer, and they said, look, why are you here? Oh, sorry, that doesn't count. And they issued me with a fixed penalty notice, okay? And they said, you're going to have to pay a fine, and maybe it's £200, £400, who knows? In the language of Romans, if that's something I would have done, then I would be unrighteous, okay? I've broken the law of the land in this case. It would be a sin. And as we've seen already in Romans, in God's sight, the whole of the human race is unrighteous. But now, when people trust in Jesus, God makes unrighteous people righteous. We've seen it in our first two verses. Let's see it now in verses 23 and 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. The word justified here literally means to be made righteous. So yes, we're all sinners, but through Jesus we're made righteous. Picture the scene, we're in God's law court, we cannot refute the charge against us. We are guilty, but then God himself says, no, I declare you righteous. To be righteous means to be in a right relationship with God. We are in a broken relationship with God because of our sin, but the person who puts their trust in Jesus, God declares, you are justified. You are not guilty. You are in a right relationship with me. God makes the unrighteous righteous. But this, of course, raises an obvious question. We've seen so much about God's justice, about his commitment to fairness, the right thing being done so far in Romans. So how could a fair God possibly take unrighteous people who are guilty, who have sinned, and declare that they're righteous? How can that possibly be fair? How can that work? Well, this is our second point. It happens through Jesus' redeeming 
work. Look again at verse 24. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So we come across another big word here. There's lots of big important words in these verses. We've had justified, we've had righteous, and now we have this idea of redemption, to be redeemed. We do use this word in our English language these days, don't we? Sometimes we talk about to redeem a voucher. Redemption, redeeming, is the language of buying, of paying for something, of a transfer of ownership. Well, when Jesus died on the cross, he redeemed those who believe in him. He paid the price for the penalty that we deserve. To explain this, we could go back to our um, lockdown breach example and imagine that uh, I'd breached lockdown, I'd been given a fixed penalty notice, and for one reason or another, I ended up in court, and my case went to court, okay? And the charge stood against me. The judge then convicts me, and he hands me my fine. Maybe now the fine's gone up to a thousand pounds because of uh, how I've dealt with it and disputed it and so on. He comes out of his seat, though, at the end of the court case when it's all over, and he gets out his checkbook, and he writes me a check for a thousand pounds for the full amount. He's paying the penalty that I deserve. Well, that judge would have redeemed me. That is a bit like the way in which God redeems us. He pays the price for us. But that is a limited analogy because there's so much more to it when it comes to what God has done. I mean, think about it in this way. God is not just a neutral judge who's kind of above what's happened. When it comes to our sin, God is the offended party. And yet even so, God paid the price for us. He redeemed us. That makes a big difference. On top of that, this language of redeeming and redemption in ancient times when Paul was writing was to do with paying for a captive to be set free. So imagine there'd been a war between one kingdom and another, and the losing side, a number of the soldiers had been taken prisoner. Well, imagine the king of the losing side comes to the prison and says, I want to redeem, I want to set free one of the prisoners. That king would have to pay a price to the other side to buy back that prisoner. And once the payment had been made, there would be a transfer, and that prisoner would come back into the king's kingdom, would be free again, would be in good relationship with that king. And so it is with us. When Jesus paid for our sin on the cross, he paid the price for a transfer to happen. We are no longer under the power of sin when we trust in Jesus. We have been transferred into God's kingdom, into his family. We belong to him. The redemption means we have been bought by God to belong to him because he has paid the price for our sins. Verse 24 says, all of this is a free gift of God. We're justified freely by his grace. We don't deserve it. We haven't earned it. It's a free gift. God has paid for all of this. We don't, do not need to pay our own way to be forgiven, to be declared righteous in God's sight. He has paid for us through Jesus' death on the cross. But there is one more question that needs to be answered here, which is what payment could possibly be enough to set people free from sin when we've seen the high standard of God's justice? Well, the answer is that Jesus' blood satisfied God's wrath. This is verse 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. We've had the language of the law court, 
We've had the language of ransom and payment. Now we have the language of the temple, this idea of a sacrifice of atonement. The NIV footnote here uh, points out that sacrifice of atonement, this word, goes back to the Day of Atonement in the book of Leviticus and later in the temple. The more technical word here, which comes up in older English translations or more literal translations, is propitiation. And that means a sacrifice which takes away wrath. In the temple, the sacrifice was an animal. On the Day of Atonement, it was a goat. And the goat was slaughtered, and its blood was poured out, and the idea is that God's wrath was poured onto the goat instead of the people. The goat's blood was shed instead of the people's blood. The goat died the death that the people deserved. So the goat was a substitute. But of course the blood of a goat is not enough to pay for people's sin. The Bible also says that. So the Day of Atonement was only a picture pointing forward to the full reality on the cross of Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, he stood in our place and God put his wrath that we deserve on Jesus instead of us. He dies as our substitute to take the wrath upon ourselves, the atoning sacrifice, the propitiation. And that's why Jesus' death on the cross is enough to pay the price for our sin. Because our sin, as we've seen so clearly in the last few weeks, deserves God's wrath. But God put forward Jesus Christ as propitiation to take the wrath that we deserve on himself when his blood was shed on the cross. And so, fourthly and finally, all of this shows God's justice. God did not sweep our sin under the carpet. He does not leave sin unpunished. Justice must be done. We've seen that. If we trust in Jesus, our sins have been paid for. And justice has been done, but it's been paid for by Jesus on the cross. Verse 26. He, that is God, did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just, and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. At the cross of Jesus, God's love and God's justice come together and meet perfectly. If God was only a just God and not a loving God, then there would be no way out for sinners under the wrath of God. But if God was only a loving God, and he turned a blind eye to justice, well then evil would go unpunished, and there'd be no fairness in this world. But the cross of Jesus Christ shows that God is perfectly a God of love and perfectly a God of justice. He's committed to both, and so in his love, he put forward his own son, Jesus Christ, to execute his justice upon him. He took the wrath that we deserve to save us. God's love and justice meet at the cross. The cross is a demonstration of God's righteous character. Well, what a glorious turnaround that is for us. God makes the unrighteous righteous through the redemption of Jesus' death on the cross because Jesus' blood took the wrath we deserve and that demonstrates God's justice. Well, if we trust in Jesus, this has happened to us. We've seen this is for everyone who believes. If we believe in Jesus, we have been declared righteous in the law court. We have been redeemed by that ransom payment. And God's wrath has been paid for in the temple on the death in the death of Jesus on the cross. As we've seen, it's all a free gift by God's grace. So as we close, let's make sure 
every single one of us listening today, that we have accepted this free gift, that we have put our trust in Jesus and received this wonderful way out from under God's wrath and way in to relationship with God. Do you know, for me, it took me 18 years of going to church as a child and as a teenager. It took till I was 18 until I actually got this, until I understood, right, oh, Jesus died as a substitute. Oh, to take the wrath that I deserve on himself. Well, let's make sure each one of us have understood this, have responded rightly, have asked Jesus to take the wrath that we deserve upon himself. Let me lead us in a prayer of faith now. Lord God, we thank you so much for the cross. We thank you that Jesus took the wrath that our sins deserve upon himself. And so we thank you for that gift and we say, please forgive me. Please make me righteous through Jesus. I receive that gift. Please assure us, Lord God, as we trust in Jesus, that we are justified. That there is no one to condemn us. That we have been redeemed. It's been paid for by Jesus on the cross. Because his blood was enough to take the wrath that we deserve on himself and away from us. Thank you, Lord God. Amen.
Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Most merciful Father, our Creator and Judge, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with all our heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We earnestly repent and are truly sorry for all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us and strengthen us to serve and obey you in lives wholly renewed by your Spirit. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God, who loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be our Saviour, forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Father God, today is the first Sunday of Lent, the season when the church worldwide marks the 40 days Jesus spent in the wilderness before he began his earthly ministry. It's also the time when as Christians we prepare ourselves to look ahead to Holy Week, Good Friday and Easter. So Father, renew us afresh this year and all who lead your church. The Church worldwide will come to fully understand that salvation comes through faith, not through works. Faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, came to this earth to die, so that all who believe be set free from sin and may have life eternal. We pray for Christians in places where they are not free to worship you publicly. Those in North Korea, Afghanistan, Somalia, Sudan, Pakistan, Eritrea, Libya, Iraq, Yemen and Iran. We ask your protection on them and on all Christians who daily face persecution, loss of livelihood, loss of freedom, even their lives, because they worship you. We pray for our own country, for the Prime Minister, the Cabinet, MPs and those who advise them. You will give them wisdom and integrity as they lead this country through these difficult times. In particular, we pray, they will make wise decisions about the ending of present restrictions and not be swayed by popular opinion. We thank you that more and more people are receiving the COVID vaccine Thank you for the skill of doctors, nurses and scientists. Now we pray the vaccine will soon be available to all worldwide, rich and poor, wherever they may be. Thank you for the warmer weather we've seen this last week. We pray too for those who are finding the dark winter months difficult this year. We think especially of the homeless, the poor lonely and the elderly. Finally, we pray for all who for any reason are in need of prayer. We pray for Prince Philip and from our own church family, the Les. And now, in a moment of quiet, we hold before you in the silence of our hearts all others known to us in need of prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We end by saying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. 
give us today our daily bread. Give us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. Today we're praying for Namibia in southwest Africa. It has a population of 2 million and 270,000 evangelical Christians. Mining for diamonds, uranium and other minerals provide significant income for Namibia, but many live in deep poverty. You can use the following prayer points to inform your own prayers or simply pray along with me now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for Namibia today. Thank you for the stability the economic progress that came after independence, and we pray for continued good government and community harmony. Please give national leaders wisdom, willingness, and resources to tackle the gap between rich and poor, land ownership issues, and HIV AIDS. Lord, we pray for healing of scars from Namibia's colonial past, apartheid, and terrorism before independence. Please bring about forgiveness and peace among perpetrators and victims. We praise you for the Lutheran and Anglican missions in the 19th century, which led to several historic movements to Christ in Namibia. We're saddened that confusion with African spiritualism and liberal theology has weakened faith. So Lord, we ask, please would you bring biblical Christ-honoring faith back to Namibia. Finally, we pray for the less evangelized in Namibia, many of whom hold a strong animistic faith. Please give creativity and perseverance to those who ministering to the roaming cattle ranching sand people. Open the hearts of those in the Kavango and Caprivi Strip, the 5,000 Himba and the 15,000 Dimba people. We praise you for the translation of the Dimba Bible and pray for it to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of Christ's name. Father, hear our prayers for this country. Praise. Teach me so.
Well, I hope that you found this morning service encouraging and helpful to you, uh, whether you're, you're just dipping a toe in the water just looking at the Christian faith or whether you've been a Christian for donkey's years. Uh, I hope there's been something to help you on your journey and um, as ever, you know, if you want to talk with me or with Ben about any aspect of the Christian faith, then please get in touch with us and we'd be happy to do that for you. Um, if you haven't already and you, you would find this useful to get um, daily prayer points uh, through Lent, then please go to the, um, the website, have a look on Church Family News and uh, sign up for those prayer points, uh, those uh, ashes to joy prayer points every day through Lent. Uh, people from uh, across Lostock Church and Dean Church have been writing these prayer points, are writing these prayer points and uh, come straight to your mobile phone or your, your WhatsApp app um, each, uh, each evening ready for the next day. Uh, so do make use of that if you would find that helpful. Let me end with um, some prayer for you, some, a prayer of blessing. Well, actually, it's, I suppose, two prayers of blessing. And the first part is from Numbers uh, chapter 6 in the Old Testament. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and be with those on your heart and be with those for whom you pray this day and evermore. Amen.